Kentucky. The bluegrass. A state that holds a rich history, natural beauty, and thriving industries. From its rolling hills and picturesque countryside to the vibrant cities, there is an abundance of treasures to discover in our state. However, Kentucky is also facing a grave challenge with child maltreatment. We confront some of the highest rates of child abuse and neglect in the country, ranking 45th out of 50 states. Our children are more likely to suffer from neglect, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Additionally, the number of children suffering from multiple medical complexities is rising. But what lies ahead? How can we shape a future of hope for Kentucky's children? Home of the Innocents. In 1880, Home of the Innocents started as a home for children that were abandoned. From eight children, at the beginning of our legacy, we began uh, to expand, to merge with other orphanages, and to take on additional children uh, throughout the decades to where now we are the state's second largest provider of residential treatment, and we are the city's only provider of emergency shelter service for children. I've been at the home since the summer of 2016, and in the last seven years, we've seen quite a few changes with the children that we serve in our residential treatment and emergency shelter program. Our youngest children are now in the community. They're being taken care of in foster homes. So the average age of the children that we serve is more like 15 or 16. Um, their acuity levels are much higher. Their behavioral health needs are much more complex. The trauma that they are showing up with is much more advanced. We've been noting an alarming trend over the last year or two for children that are beginning to express suicide ideation. I am seeing a lot more aggressive behaviors now in the kids that we have versus when I first started. Not being able to tell you what they need, what they want, how you can help them. So their go-to is aggression. I feel like all of the kids here had like a lot of traumatic experiences and they do certain behaviors as like a coping mechanism or like a reaction to the trauma and then they just do bad choices and end up somewhere like this. Now it's just like you, you try to sit down and talk to them and reason with them and they're looking at you like, what are you saying? We're getting children in that's not, they can't, they're not able to comprehend. A lot of kids that I have particularly, I've witnessed a lot of my youth that have been exposed to sex trafficking. I had a client that had that happen, and this is prior to her coming to us, and she met up with someone on the internet. They had basically been grooming her, uh, convinced her to sneak out and to leave her phone. She was away from her mother for maybe three to six months, and the details of what this child went through, because she was held captive, she could barely even recant that to you because it was so painful. We need a system that responds to what we are seeing today. We know we need to do things differently, and you all have led the way for us in being able to think about how to put those pieces together to really adapt to an individual child and family's needs. The children of our state are in a dark place. But the home has always risen to the challenge to provide options and solutions to fix those issues. I'm optimistic that we can be a leader in the state to help transform and reimagine the child welfare system for our children because they deserve it. We really want to move from a place where we react to what the child needs to being preventative and being progressive in what it is that we're going to do. And the home can help lead this transformation not only for the children that we serve, but the children of the entire Commonwealth. I wish we could touch every single child in the world and get them to where they need to be. That's my hope, is that one day we can, we can just get them to the future, to a great future. As the home continued to grow, in 1975, we were approached by the Jewish Home for Convalescent Children, and we were asked to take on the needs of several medically complex children. 
And once again, the home said, we'll be the change, we'll help support these children. The children that we serve in the convalescent center have changed quite a bit. Just back in 2016, the average age of our residents were probably eight or nine. Today, the average age of our residents is probably more like 14 or 15. Most of the kids that were, I would say, looking back 20 years ago, didn't have the same kind of complexity that our children do today. They need more respiratory support, more nursing support, more physician support. 20 of our 76 residents have actually eclipsed the age of 21. The care that they're receiving from us helps to encourage their lifelines uh, to be longer, but that creates a problem. So there's not an appropriate place for these young adults to go, but for every young adult that we have in our facility, it's a bed that a child is not able to occupy. When they reach the age of 21, because that is our licensed capacity, um, they are expected to transition. It is very difficult to look their parent in the eye and say, we've got to transition them onto an adult facility or to an intermediate care facility. There's no assurance that they're going to do well. There's no assurance that they're going to survive for any length of time. It's, it's difficult. It is one of the primary reasons I took this role, is to be able to do something to fix that. When residents discharge from our facility, they leave us very stable. And about a third of our residents within the first 18 to 24 months of their discharge from our facility pass away. And that really is heartbreaking to our team. It's heartbreaking to the families because we know that these children who are always children to us who become young adults deserve better. Their care should continue. Once again, the home is prepared to be the change. We want to build the state's first skilled nursing facility for young adults. We want this new facility to be a companion of sorts to our pediatric facility so that the children that age out of our pediatric facility, their lives will continue. The care that they receive from us will continue in a new facility that's age appropriate for them where they can continue to thrive. So there are about 20 young adult residents right now, so residents that are over 21, and it's been really difficult in working with them on how to really understand this very abstract concept of moving when a lot of those residents have been here since they were infants their entire lives. This is the only home they know. It's my hope that eventually I can say the home is where you will stay, and the home will be able to provide that kind of next step for them and their developmental transition as they continue through adulthood. What gives me hope is that because of Home of the Innocents and partners across the state, we come together and collaborate in ways that I think are, are, are better than we have before. And we continue to remember that we always have to ask ourselves the question, whose needs are we trying to meet? And it has always got to be the child and family. And I believe Home of the Innocents does that. The home has a rich history of rising to the challenges and being the change to help support the children and families, not only for our organization, but across the entire state. Home of the Innocents, enriching the lives of children and families with hope, health, and happiness. <laughs>